Greece. Okay, so our first presenter is uh, Michael Rotem. Um, and I'm just doing brief bios because the full bios are in the, uh, are in the conference programme. So Mikhail is a PhD student in the School of Political Science, Government and International Affairs at Tel Aviv University in Israel with a dissertation focusing on understanding how humans justify their control over animals and what changes their minds in that matter. So I'll pass over to you, Mikhail. Thank you so much. Uh, for the conference, for all the organizers, really thanks. I just shared the presentation. Okay, so it's really, I'm really happy to be here. And uh, I just want to say that this lecture is part of a presentation that is part of a, a paper I wrote for people from the discipline of political science and power relation or outside the field of non-human animals. So think of this presentation from this perspective, and I would really love to hear your opinion, critiques, ideas regarding it. So the main issue I will address is the multi-species rituals in the specific context of power relation from its epistemological direction. I will ask why is it that in the first place, non-human animals are not included as a legitimate research object in the study of power relation, and how can we include them? Of course, this issue is also relevant to other fields. It's relevant to sociology, to anthropology. One might ask how non-human animals can be included in the study of social science in general. In any case, I will refer to power relationships. It's, that's the, the field I'm coming from. So the main point I will address, the main stream definition of power, key question, then I introduce the component required to understand power relations. And finally, what is multi-species power relations? Okay, so let's begin with the mainstream definitions of power. Usually when study power relationships, there are mainstream definitions. So what is power? According to Thomas Hobbes, Hobbes describes power as the ability of a man to get what he wants, whether by original or instrumental means. For Weber, power is the chance to carry out the will of an individual or a group of people within a social relationship without resistance. When there is no resistance, power is legitimized. For Robert Dahl, A has power over B to the extent that A concept B to do something that B would not do otherwise. The power actors may be individual groups, roles, government, and nation states. Between all definitions of power mentioned, there are differences, but there are also basic similarities. Whether the power relation concerns people in a natural state, individual groups, societies, or mainstream discourses, they are related in that way that they are created only by human, and they relate to human as the ultimate object of study. The classic definitions mostly create a buffer between humans and non-human animals and human and nature, ontologically assuming that when thinking of power relation, only human power relations are worthy to study. To understand why power relations are relevant to non-human animals between themselves and to humans and non-human animals, it is necessary to break down the definition of power relation and to understand how the power relation component actually apply not only to humans. So what are power relations? Relationship is an association of connection between objects, events, variables, or their phenomena. In relationships, there must be a connection between two or more entities. If relations are based on connection, it must be between at least two entities, individuals, societies, community, who can respond to the other side reaction in some way, whether verbally, physically, or even by thinking something as a result of the other side action. In power relation, what connect the actors involved in the power relationships is that they connect to one another in a way that produces involuntary dependency on each other. Dependency can be created by many means and ways. In Hobbes' state of nature, for example, individuals fear one another's potential power as natural resources are limited. In this case, individual connect to the other because they depend on the other human necessity, which might come at the expense of the other. In Weber and Dahl's concept of power, 
when A causes B to do something B would not do other than, otherwise, then there is an involuntary dependency on each other. What connects A to B is a form of power A has over B, whether manipulation or psychological power. Non-human animals too experience power relationship with each other. They also experience involuntary dependency on one another. There are situations of fights between non-human animals. Throughout their lives, animals frequently interact with other individuals. The result of this interaction may be mutually beneficial, while others lead to conflict of interest in form of coercive power. But it's not only coercive power. There are also situations of power manipulation between non-human animals. Some primates do not only force coercive power, but they have their own diplomatic ways to achieve power and get things from the other. Chimpanzees, for example, create power sharing coalition. The wall argued that it is not enough simply to be the strongest, as the strongest must keep supporters to get the power. There are also situations between human and non-human animals that, real, that make us realizing that non-human animals create manipulation over humans. There are interactions between human and non-human animals in which both sides affect each other. Consider the situation of a person walking with a dog. During the walk, the dog stops and does not want to continue. The dog's owner tries to move him by force, but the dog refuses. At that moment, the dog, the dog experiences presence and agency, expresses his desire, and perhaps lead to a change of a trajectory. He showed body sign, but there was no intentional human-dog connection about the power relation. When there is no direct communication about the situation, then the situation of power relation does not come to the human cons consciousness as such. Indeed, non-human animals, as well as human and non-human animals, share situation of power relations. So the questions are why do mainstream studies does not ign does ignore human-animal power relationships? I mean the political science mainstream studies. And given that there is relationships power relation between them, how can we study them? So let's begin with question one. Why, when thinking and talking about power relation, the discourse in political science usually refer only to human beings? It can be said that human thought is anthropocentric, concentrated in men, that the social science in general are anthropocentric. But why it is like that? And why it is like that in the context of power relations? The answer to that, in my view, lies in the component needed to understand power relations. In general, in order to understand power relations, we need to understand the intentions and thoughts of the parties involved. Human and research, in general, always trying to understand the thoughts of the other. The study of power relations between countries, for example, seek to understand the intentions of the countries involved. Israel is attempt to understand Iran and opposite. Think, for example, of the definition of power according to Dahl. Power exists when A causes B to do something that he or she would have never done in the absence of A. A must understand B's intentions in order to get him or her to do something. A must understand what B thinks and what will cause him or her to take the action that A orders. So the question arises, what are the elements needed to be able to understand each other's intention? First is consciousness. Consciousness is one of the components. It is important to be aware of ourselves and of our surrounding. Consciousness about power relations occurs when someone is able to acknowledge the power relation or the power situation. In the case of human, power can be both conscious and communicated, but it can be also unconscious with the potential to become conscious. Power is consciously when all parties, A and B, in the power relations are aware at the present time of the other side enforcement of power. Power is humanly unconscious when A enforces power over B, but neither A nor B, or in some cases only B, are consciously aware and communicate about, about the power relation. The sides involved in the situation experience their lives without being aware that they are in a power relation. 
However, both A and B has the potential to become conscious to the power relation. For example, think about the sentence, the personal is political, means that there are power relations between men and women on the private sphere, but they are not necessarily aware to these power relations. However, they both can become aware. What about non-human animals? Non-human animals do have consciousness. In recent years, there has been almost no question about whether non-human animals have consciousness. Debate about animals' consciousness have moved from the question of whether any non-human animal are conscious to the question of which animals are conscious and what form their conscious experience take. Non-human animals express power relation, but do they conscious of the situation of power? The term power, power is a human term, so non-human animals don't use it, but what is going on in their mind in a situation of power? Do they think of it in their own language? Because awareness is not measured at zero or one, the question is too broad to generalize in relation to all non-human animals. Just as human beings have a different level of consciousness, so too do types of animals. And within each species, it's on, there are creatures who are, are more aware than others. Although non-human animals might be aware in some ways of the situation of power, it is not clear to human what is going on in their minds, what they are thinking about, or what they are experiencing mentally in a power relation. And that leads us to the second component, which is theory of mind. Although non-human animals have mind, consciousness, and communication skills, these function differently from those of human, and human want to understand non-human animals find the following problem. Given that non-human animals have mind and consciousness, how can we understand their thinking and intention if we don't speak the same language? Despite grasping the idea that involuntary dependency exists between human and non-human animals, to realize that there are power relations between any sides, humans usually need to figure out what is going on in the mind of the sides involved in the power relations in order to understand their intentions. When human possess power, it is possible for other human to try and at least to figure out what is going on in the other person's mind, an ability called theory of mind. Figuring out what is going on in the other mind might lead us to understanding the intention of the sides involving in the power relation. Scholars of power relations indeed try to understand the intention of the sides involved in the power relation, interrupting the other intentions, whether individuals, societies, leaders, and states. It's a common practice to do in the study of power relations. When scholars investigate non-human animal cognition, they watch non-human animals behavior and make experiments. By watching and doing experiments, researchers can learn and draw conclusions about the abilities of the non-human animals. These methods, however, don't address the question of understanding non-human animal thoughts. Human can emotionally, emotionally get into the non-human animal shoe, and they can get into the ability of theory of mind is happen and exists between human and non-human animals, especially emotionally. But it's harder to get really into their mind because our biology function differently. It's not that we can't, but it's harder. That leads to the conclusion that there is a deadlock, a mental tension between humans and non-human animals, a tension that stems from realizing that humans don't understand what is going on in the non-human animal's mind, because we don't have the same life, life experience. Carl Safina mentioned this in his book, Beyond Words. He said that we can see the non-human animal's brain, but we can't see their minds. Yet we can see the working of minds and the logic of behavior. So that implies also to power relations study. We can't see their minds, but we can see influence. You can see influence between non-human animals and between human and non-human animals, but we can see intentions. So the question arises, if we can't learn non-human animals exact intentions, how can we learn the power relations between them? If we think of power relations in a narrow sense, 
as relation that occur exclusively between humans to which specific thoughts can be attributed and their intention understood literally, the non-human animals power relation, as well as human and non-human animals power relations, cannot take part in the study of the intention behind the use of force and power. The deadlock of the human ability to understand the non-human animal's experience is a problem only if we insist on understanding the intentions and thinking of the sides involved in the power relation. Multi-species power relations do not strive to do that. To study multi-species power relations, we must assume that the intention is not a central motive that must be understood in power relation research. Rather, influence is. Multi-species power relations can be studied in several ways. The framework I suggest can give an idea for the question of how non-human animals, human and non-human animals, power relationships can be studied in the context of multi-species power relations. I base this framework on existing studies to which I gave a framework and typology. The multi-species power relations study can be studied in three ways bilateral and unilateral study, or a mix of both. In the multi-species power relationship study, the object of the study can be both human and non-human animals. Surpass this bilateral power relation. The bilateral power relations focus on the mutual power relation between human and non-human animals. In studying the power relations, we will examine how humans and non-human animals actually affect each other, what happens between them in the context of power relations. The starting point of the bilateral power relationship is that all animals have an active agent, which means that we will examine non-human animals' effect on each other and or on the person in the power relations situation. How to study bilateral power relation? Symbolic interaction studies focuses on how the interaction between different entities affect each other, how the interaction produce and contracts the other. In the symbolic interaction, the non-human animal act as an active agent because they affect the person directly. For example, in a situation where the cat is expressing power on its owner, then the question of what the cat thoughts and its intention will not be asked, what matter is the impact on the human itself, on the ground? The second way to study human-non-human relation is the unilateral multi-species power relation. In the unilateral study, unlike in the bilateral studies, non-human animals do not serve as an active agent. Unilateral studies examine the way in which human institution, social and cultural practices, legislation and social norms produce power over non-human animals. There are two ways to study the unilateral power relation. First, bottom-up analysis. Bottom-up analysis focuses on the ways in which social groups justify their control over animals. In this analysis, human intention will actually be at the center of the investigation. Second, top-bottom analysis, which focuses on how social structure changes the dynamic of human, non-human animals' power relations. In the top model unilateral study, the research object through which the study will examine the question of power relations are the human social institutions. Finally, there is the mixed of attitude. In the mixed of attitude, both bilateral and unilateral power relation can be explored in one study. Such a study would separate the situation in which non-human animal acts directly as an agent a situation in which it is active from a situation in which the non-human animal is inactive. For example, symbolic interaction and human politics. The first phase of such research is a multi-species ethnographic investigation, which examines how humans are affected directly by interaction with non-human animals. The second phase of the interactive study will examine how the interaction between human and non-human animals shape the human political life. That is to say, in the first stage, the non-human animal is active, shaping and influencing human. And in the second stage, human implement their experiment, experience with the non-human animal into their own political institution. Second, non-human animal power relation.
If the power relations assume an involuntary dependence on each other, then the power relation between different groups of non-human animals apart can also be served as a study model. The purpose of such a study is to examine how mechanism of power relations are expressed between non-human animals themselves. The first phase of the study will focus on understanding the power relation between non-human animals, but unlike zoology, such research will focus not only on non-human animals. In the second stage, as social science researchers, we would want to understand what can be learned from the power relations between animals in relation to the power relation between humans. In conclusion, why should we study power relations among non-human animals? In the social science, we study human society in general, and in political theory and political science, we study power relations in particular. But if power relation exists not only between humans themselves, but also between non-human animals and between human and non-human animals, then to better understand power relations, we might study those relations and change the way we think about power. Given that it is not only human who exert their power over the living world, there is room to expand the object of political and analytical unit studies in social sciences and humanities and strive to be as aware of them as possible. Treating other beings as active rather than merely passive make it possible to think of politics not only as a field that distinguishes human beings, but also as a concept that includes a system of complex power relationships between different entities. And that's it. If you have a question or something, I would love to, to speak after that. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Michal, um, for that really thoughtful paper, a word like power that I think we often use quite simplistically. It's really useful to hear it kind of talked through in a much more forensic and, and particular and specific way. So thank you for that. And I'm sure there'll be questions uh, later on uh, when we've heard the other two papers. Um, so uh, next I'll move to Pablo Perez Castillo. Um, and uh, who's a PhD candidate at the School of Humanities at Royal Holloway University of London uh, and a visitor researcher at the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law and his thesis in philosophy focuses on understanding the role human language plays in producing anthropocentrism and the importance of animal language in relation to political agency and zoo democracy. So Pablo, I'll pass over to you. Hey, thanks, Brett. Um, let me I mean, thanks for organizing the conference, by the way, it's wonderful so far. Let me share my screen one second. Um, there it goes. Share screen. Is that work? That's there. Brilliant. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So uh, my talk today is going to be basically about intersectionality as a method of analysis or a framework uh, depending on the authors, they use it in different ways. And I will basically look at uh, whether intersectionality is a limited method of analysis and um, kind of a proposal um, that emerges from my PhD thesis that I'm calling interconstitutionality. Um, well, the first thing that's just very briefly about the structure, uh, I will first explain a little bit about my background to sort of situate the, the talk, then what is intersectionality? and why is a limited method of analysis to understand oppressions. And then my proposal of interconstitutionality, which as far as I know, no one has uh, proposed this method of analysis, but I want to say two things about it. One, I think in many instances, intersectional scholars are already using that method of analysis. It's just that it has not been articulated. And this leads sometimes to some problems that I will try to explain later. And secondly, that the person who has influenced me the most perhaps to think of this method is Kledzin Kim. She says that, for example, in the Marda and Mattering in Harambe's House article, she says that racism and animalness are dynamically interconstituted all the way down. So as you can see, she's using here the word interconstituted. Um, and that this kind of language is really present in the work, work of Afco and the Kledzin Kim and other authors, the idea that oppressions are composed by each other, they constitute each other, they are not merely intersecting at the crossroads, as it were. So just very briefly about my background, as Brett was saying, 
Uh, I come from a continental philosophy background. Uh, the work of Martin Heidegger and Jacques Derrida are central in my PhD thesis. And I started working on the works. I spent like one or two years reading Heidegger and Derrida in a way. And then by progressively, I've got more into what is now known as intersectionality. So uh, critical race theory, ecofeminism, uh, post-colonial theory, and critical disability studies figure in my work, and especially critical race theory and um, ecofeminism. The work of Dinesh Wadiwell is really important in my thesis. For example, um, and if you, this is the title of my thesis, The Language of Zoo Democracy, Contesting Human Dominion Over Animals. I know that Zipper is going to talk later about human sovereignty. You could put human sovereignty over animals. That is the term that Dinesh Wadiwell uses in the war against animals. But what I'm trying to understand in my thesis is what is the role that language plays in forming and in constituting our subjectivities to be anthropocentric and to hold a position of human dominion of animals, a right to decide over others' lives. So that's more or less kind of what I, I'm going to talk a little bit about these things because it's very important for the kind of method that emerges from my thesis of interconstitutionality. But something I want to say now briefly up front is that when I talk of language, I do not mean languages such as English, French, Arabic, and so on. I do not mean that. And when I talk of concepts, I'm not going to mean either a kind of representationalist understanding of a concept. So if you think, for example, of the concept of te, uh, what we tend to think of when we think of concepts and language and words is that there is the concept te, and then we have uh, many words in different languages to refer to that concept. So we have, uh, I don't know, in Spanish, the word silla, in English, the word te, and then we have this concept that is there, I, I more or less, and you know, um, that's the idea, basically. So when I, when I think of language, what I'm trying to think of is a kind of conceptual force, as I call it. And I also use the language in my thesis that I say that concepts have their own gravitational fields. And what I try to kind of um, explain with that is that when we think of a concept, such as the concept of the human or the concept of the animal, um, it feels that it's very localizable. So we have, there it is the concept of the human, there it is the concept of the animal or reason or whatever, or power. And we can reconceptualize it and redefine it as we please, as it were. So when, from the work of Martin Heidegger, a very different thinking under Derrida as well, who is very influenced by Heidegger, a very different thinking of concepts emerges, which is the idea that we are born into a language that we do not decide. We are born into a kind of conceptual line, landscape that we are not deciding and that constitutes who we are. Um, so if you think, for instance, of the concept of the human, we might write an article and say, I'm going to refer, when I use the word se, it will mean the human, right? So one can do that all the way through, and then when one reads se, it means human. But wh what, wh whatever reconceptualization one might offer, the concept of the human as this kind of, you know, the paradigmatic human person of the white, able-bodied, rational, independent man is going to act in how we read that text and how we exist in reality. So that's more or less what I'm trying to think of. And it's not so much related to languages, but it structures all languages, if you like. This, as I also use the terminology of conceptuality, Western conceptuality I talk of as well in my work. So that's what I'm going to refer to language and how I'm going to understand concepts more or less. Well, I've already said this, that a method has emerged from my thesis because I was reading a lot of intersectional scholarship and feeling that some of my findings could not be explained through um, the kind of intersectional method that some of us were using, but it really emerges from intersectionality as it were. So what is intersectionality? The first kind of thing I wanted to say. So Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a black woman uh, a black, uh, and lawyer as well, in 1987, she um, coined the term, and the idea was to say, look, we cannot think of oppressions as being isolated from each other. The language that intersectionality uses a lot is the language of oppressions are connected. They overlap with each other. They are juxtaposed. We are going to see that in a second. Um, they intersect at the crossroads, as it were. So if we look at different fields, they are going to illuminate the needs of a given oppression better. But if we look at only with a kind of single issue or sing like one view, right? Kind of thing, one dimension is not going to, to explain the oppression appropriately. And this quote by Crenshaw, I think, explains this in part. So she says, <clears throat> discrimination, like traffic through an intersection, may flow in one direction and it may flow in another. 
Similarly, if a black woman is harmed because she's in the intersection, her injury could result from sex discrimination or rape discrimination. Yet, often they experience double discrimination, the combined effects of practices with, which discriminate on the basis of race and on the basis of sex. And sometimes they experience discrimination as black women, not the sum of race and sex discrimination, but as black women. So what we can see here is four forms of discrimination that black women can experience. The first two, which are kind of explained in these bits here, is so black women, the idea is that they can be discriminated. Uh, so there can be sex discrimination, one. There can be race discrimination, another one. Also, uh, the combined effects of both. So the sum of both, which they remain separated, but the combination of both can, um, a, a black woman can experience the, the, the combination of both. And then the fourth one, this would be a third, the fourth one is when black women experience discrimination as black women. So the idea here is that uh, race, uh, discrimination in terms of race and, and uh, sex are going to be merged. They fuse, they are one thing. A black woman is discriminated as a black woman. That fourth is what to me is interconstitutionality. And it is that's going to be my target. I really think that we should focus on that one. And here, the work of um, uh, Afco is really good, I think, in racism as zoological witchcraft. I'm drawing on her critique. I will, do, what I'm going to say now is uh, well, the thing is, I will take her critique and endorse it, um, although with some qualifications. But it's just that I think that the kind of proposal she provides does not really do the work that I believe of course herself intends it to do. So um, her critique of this kind of approach that uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is putting forth is that of course says, look, in reality, a lot of intersectional thinking, it's still uh, thinking in a two dimensional sense way in which we have the house of race, the house of gender and the house of class anthropocentrism, um, I don't know, ableism and so on. So if you think of, if you like knowledge systems, epistemologies, um, languages and so on, whatever one want to focus on or power in different aspects, what of course saying is there is a still a separation between race, gender and class. And as a matter of fact, just think about this language I was mentioning before. The language is the language of intersection. The language is overlapping. The language of juxtaposition. The language of, of connection or interconnection they all imply and connote externality. The oppressions are in a relationship of externality to each other, and then they connect. They connect or they meet up at crossroads. As a Krimberle Crenshaw says, right? Discrimination like traffic through an intersection. So um, actually, Afko, when she is writing this critique, she does not reference Crenshaw herself, but she does criticize the idea that uh, oppressions meet up at crossroads as if they were not constituting each other. And for that reason, what kind of Afco is saying is we should focus on the fourth one that Crenshaw identifies. Black women are discriminated as black women. And therefore, we cannot think of three houses, but instead of one house in which all these kind of knowledge systems, culture, epistemologies, uh, and so on, all the isms, if you like, are one single house. And we need to try to understand it and analyze it from that kind of perspective in a more holistic sense. And it is in this sense that AFCO proposes a multidimensional approach to understanding oppressions. So the idea is there is one kind of thing, and then we look at the different dimensions, and we see here different doors, and one can access to this uh, kind of house, if you like. Let's think about it in terms of the Western epistemological established order, or what I call Western conceptuality with the human-animal distinction playing a very important role, the reason and reason, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, woman-man, uh, culture and nature, all that kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, of course, says here, I, I really like this grammar. Uh, I endorse it in my work. She says, white supremacy is composed of anti-animal sentiments. Hence, in order to take down this ideology, our activism must include a robust analysis of animals within the racial landscape. To me, this within is very important. This composed is very important. So one cannot The racial landscape and the same would operate uh, when it comes to the oppression of black people we need to understand the oppression of black people within an animalized landscape and here the work of afco again and Claire Jenkins is absolutely brilliant 
in this respect, uh, pledging him in dangerous crossings, uh, explains this kind of insight uh, at length there. And it is in the sense that, of course, of says in an interview, gender is lived through race. So if you think again about the four forms in which a black woman could be discriminated, what this kind of insight is telling us is that the first three that Crenshaw identified would be mistaken. So one, a black woman cannot be discriminated only in terms of race or only in terms of uh, gender. It will not work because our subjectivities are already um, kind of structured um, to be gendered and to be racial and, so, and to be, I don't know how it would be the verb, ableized, you know, in terms of ableism, uh, animalized and so on. So we need to try to understand. And also, it's not only that our subjectivities are structured by this, but that we are going to then perceive other beings already as being always racialized, always gendered, always animalized, and so on. This is going to play a very important uh, role in understanding how oppression operates. So again, it's not a relationship of externality as intersectionality connotes. It's a relationship of interconstitutionality. We are constituted by all these things. Uh, similarly, Kledzinkin has this wonderful quote as well that I really like, race, species, and other taxonomies of power, a structure, how we see, think, feel, and act. And I want to mention here, I, for the people that attended yesterday's um, kind of discussion in the evening, uh, Vasil Stanescu, he was insisting that uh, when meat eaters um, decide uh, to look away, an exercise of disavowal, as it were, he talked of willful ignorance. People decide, they don't want to see, people decide, they don't want to know. If we read Kledgen Kim's ethic of mutual avowal carefully, and we try to be sensitive to what's going on on the other side and empathize in the congruent sense, then uh, what we need to try to understand is not to say, these people are making this evil decision of just willful ignorance. Instead, I, what an interconstitutional method would stress is we need to understand how these taxonomies of power structure our, our gaze, our thinking, how we feel and how we act. I really think that our emphasis should be there. And by saying all this, by the way, I do not want to imply that we should exempt anybody from responsibility. I think that there is a less degree of decision making going on. But I just think that our emphasis should be elsewhere. And that's what I, I try to kind of bring to the fore as it were. And it is in this respect that I want to qualify AFCO's proposal because her multidimensional approach, as it, it is still, um, when she explains about it, and she offers this picture to explain it in racism as zoological witchcraft, we still see people, human beings, as being outside the house. So even though Afko talks of gender being lived through race, and even though Afko endorses Claire Jenkins' work when she was saying, you know, that um, these taxonomies of power, race, species, and so on, structure how we see, how we feel, and how we act, even though Afko also endorses this quote that I said at the beginning, that animalness and racism are dynamically interconstituted all the way down, we still see human beings as being outside the house and accessing to it through different doors, as if the house was external to us, as if we were not born into this violent culture of, that is racist, this political system that is structurally sexist and ableist and so on, and kind of co-opts our ways of thinking, feeling, and acting. So I just disagree with Afko when she locates humans outside the house. We are the house in itself. And as a matter of fact, in my view, the house is a wrong metaphor, because that's why I, why I was trying to say at the beginning, and this is very related to, as well in part, Foucault's understanding of power, if one like. So when the reason I was talking of language as a conceptual force, and the reason I talk in my work of concepts, of concepts as having a gravitational field, is that the way that our subjectivities are structured by, for example, of constituted by, for example, the human-animal distinction, cannot be thought in terms of, here's the concept of the human, here's the concept of the animal. We need to think of it in a much more dispersed sense. When Foucault talks of power, for example, he says that sort of power permeates reality. As it were, and is present everywhere in relationships. And this kind of, it has a sort of micro dispersal force. One cannot say power is there and point where it is exactly. It permeates reality and how subjects operate, relate to each other, and so on. So the, the metaphor of the house continues to localize and kind of say that's where it is. And then trying to say it's much more dispersed, much more subtle. We cannot really say, there you have it, right? And grasp it as it were. It's ungraspable, the nature of power, uh, how, how the force of these concepts and so on. 
So I just not very happy with this kind of metaphor of the house, even though it's helpful in some respects. And when one, when Afco is uh, kind of using this metaphor and this way of thinking of the humans are still outside the house, and this is what I was trying to say about Basil Stanisku's point yesterday, I really think that this way of thinking leads us to make this kind of claim. The ways in which the dominant class gets to determine whose life matters and whose life doesn't, as well as who is human and who is animal, constitute a zoological sport. So it's just, after all, a kind of game that one makes a decision as, because we are external to it. And one is very kind of willingly and in a very conscious manner, just making a choice. And I just don't think this is very helpful. And again, I do not want to exempt anyone from responsibility. I'm not trying to say that, but even the dominant class, and this, by the way, this to me applies to all humans, more or less, not all humans, but most humans uh, in the world, I would even go as far as to say that. The, the idea is that if we are falling into a world that is racist, sexist, and so on, including those members of the dominant class that is capitalist, violent in many ways, we need to think that all these things are constituting us as subjects. And then when we think of choice and decision-making processes, what that choice is looks very different to this kind of language, which I, I really want to insist, I don't want to accept anyone from responsibility, but rather to emphasize or rather put the emphasis somewhere else, right? And because the idea is that we are born into and we are constituted by this language I was mentioning, the established Western epistemological order, a violent, ableist and sexist culture, a structurally racist and sexist, sexist political system, and the post-colonial world. We are all born there. Um, so what I think an interconstitutional method of analysis would emphasize and kind of say to us, where should we focus? Is some questions of this kind. Why do people choose to play the racist zoological sport? And what are the epistemic, ontological, and ethico-political conditions that lead humans to determine whose life matters and whose doesn't? In kind of the human sovereignty framework of Ines Wadiwell. So what is the epistemic conditions that leads us to be born and be positioned uh, and holding a right to decide other animals' lives. What are those conditions? And it is here where then the choice is going to change quite a bit the meaning and our emphasis is going to be on these kind of conditions sort of thing. So now kind of to close, just remember that intersectionality focuses on these relationships of externality. It puts the emphasis on um, the language of intersection of uh, overlapping of interconnection of juxtaposition and so on but if we are constituted by all these things it seems to just not be able to explain and not be able to focus on the questions that to me are the key to a kind of um, deconstruct uh, oppression and and so on so that's more or less what I wanted to say. I just reached the 20 minutes exactly. I have here is my contact details. If somebody wants to uh, talk about these things, I'm always very happy to talk about all these matters. So please feel free to uh, reach out. And yeah, and I look forward to the questions too. <laughs> Thank you, Pablo. That was that was great. Uh, lots of um, uh, very kind of timely and contemporary uh, topics that you covered there which I think we're all kind of grappling with and working our way through. So it's great to have all of that stuff kind of outlined and given a framework for us to think that through. Thank you. Um, and so the final presentation today is from uh, Zipporah Weisberg, who's an independent scholar and animal activist currently living in Granada in Spain. In 2013, uh, Zipporah completed her PhD in social and political thought at York University and was awarded the Apple Postdoc Fellowship at Queen's University, Canada. And in March earlier this year, it's awarded a Culture and Animals Foundation grant for her research on interspecies friendship and animal agency in animal sanctuaries. And so I'll pass over to you now. Mike's not on. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. Thank you very much. Um, really lovely to be here, uh, as I, I've mentioned um, in previous online uh, conferences and uh, pre on and, and face to face conferences over the past um, several years since formally leaving academia uh, it's it's been a struggle to stay connected um, and it's always I always look forward to ECAS, especially to reconnect with people um, to network and just to hear about what's going on it's hard for me to keep up with all the amazing scholarship so i'm really happy to be here. Um, Okay, so I'm actually I don't have a fancy PowerPoint presentation. I'm doing it old school, uh, just reading a paper. So uh, you'll just 
I guess, uh, have me to look at <laughs> throughout this and, and no uh, visual guides. So I apologize if you, if you find that easier to follow. Okay, so uh, this paper is uh, called Bear Life, Laid Bear, Human Sovereignty and Animal Objection in the Context of the Global Cor Coronavirus Pandemic. So the paper draws on Agamben's discussion of biopolitics, specifically his concepts of bear life and the state of exception in his book, uh, Homo Soccer, Sovereign Power and Bear Life, uh, uh, as he lays it out in that book, as the basis for investigating the status of non-human animals, particularly animals used for research in the midst of the global COVID-19 pandemic. So before continuing, I, I want to um, say that I'm of Agamben's project to address or provide a meaningful framework for the critical analysis of animal exploitation overall. and news of its origin, although now uncertain, and the animal tests underway to develop a vaccine started to come out, I couldn't help but think of Agamben's concepts of bare life and also his discussion of the state of exception. Um, so perhaps against my better judgment, I've decided to, and probably far too uncritically, use his framework and categories of analysis as a basis for shedding light on the specific moment uh, in human animal history, in this disastrous history of, of human animal relations. Uh, to conclude my discussion, if I have time, I turn admittedly awkwardly from Agamben to Marcuse. Uh, I look to Marcuse in this case to discuss the social function of aggression within the medical sciences, uh, society in general, and the media in particular, and its role in perpetuating the suicidal status quo. In both Agamben and Marcuse's decidedly diverse philosophical and political projects, we do find an identical claim that society, uh, modern society, is founded on a series of dangerous contradictions and paradoxes. So uh, the first section is lab, lab animals as bare life laid bare. So non-human animal status as Zoe or bare life, life as such, as opposed to bios or qualified life is perhaps more evident today at the end of the first year of the global pandemic than ever before. Nicole Shukin points out that pandemics such as H5N1 or avian flu and AIDS, a result of increasing and malignant biomobility or the movement of animal, animal bodies across borders cause us to inadvertently challenge the species divide and quote, formally distinct barriers separating other species begin to imaginatively and physically disintegrate. Shukin has a point here that these barriers um, uh, are disintegrate to an extent. Um, however, I would argue that while physical and species borders are crossed in one sense, they are reinforced in another by confirming animal status as contaminants and instruments at the same time of decontamination the very real and concrete consequences of which are mass calls on one hand and intensified animal research on the other. So critical as I am of Shukin's larger project and of Foucault as well, she also has a point when she suggests that in the context of a pandemic, quote, a logic of power associated by Foucault with the practices of technologies of the state expands to include supranational institutions and techniques devoted to tracking global human and animal health and accelerates as a nano project working under the pressure of time to achieve greater knowledge of and control over microbial nature. So there's more to say on that, but uh, as, as a result of time limitations, I'll just leave it there. In any case, the response to the pandemic has passed into sharp relief non-human animals reduction, both in the public imagination and scientific practice to specimens or generalized life, uh, Zoe, stripped of any potential to shape or live their lives in a meaningful way. As bare life, non-human animals are regarded as objects on which to test vaccines or as contaminants that ought to be called in the millions without hesitation. Like Homo Sacer or the sacred man who Agamben explains, according to ancient Roman law, could be killed but not sacrificed, animals are subject to an irreversible juridical and moral ban. They are included in the law, that is as test subjects, commodities, contaminants, etc., by way of their exclusion, that is from its protection. As self-appointed sovereign vis-a-vis -vis other animals, human beings have imposed a permanent and particularly pernicious state of exception on the latter in which the flourishing, and in this case, preserving of human life is believed to depend entirely on the taking or eliminating of animal life. As bare life, 
stripped of every right, non-human animals are killed in the millions without the interference of moral perturbation although or legal recourse. Although what should be deemed exceptional or impermissible, the commission of violence against animals for research or for any other purposes has been normalized over the centuries, the rush to develop vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 has reinforced the ideological foundations of animal research. Moral objections to animal research are rarely raised outside of animal rights communities and brutal experiments on mice, rhesus macaques, African greens, marmosets, ferrets, pigs, and hamsters, among other animals, are presented in the media as necessary steps towards ending the pandemic. At the same time, animals used in research are at the center of the human sovereign and sovereign nation states thinking and activities, inasmuch as geopolitics are at the moment governed not only by perpetual war, but by the race for and distribution of effective vaccines that can deal with the virus and its emerging variants. Ironically, in their position of total objection as bare life, animals wield tremendous power over human beings, if only in as much as without their subjugation, the human empire would collapse. Um, right, okay. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna mention another caveat here um, that I drop, that I take from Calarco. So while I've been using bare life to analyze um, uh, the, the status of animals at the moment and in general, I do wanna note that as Calarco points out in his discussion of bare life, Agamben was not concerned with animals as such. Agamben, he explains, quote, analyzes the separation of Zoe and Bios within human life only to leave the question of animal life and politics suspended. That said, and as I've been trying to show, I do think the categories can be extended or at least crudely appropriated for this purpose. So in that vein, I continue. Um, one more caveat, however, it is important to emphasize that the reduction of animals to bare life is by no means limited to the laboratory or to the eruption of the pandemic. It is ubiquitous across the animal industrial complex and applies to all forms of animal exploitation. Similarly, the state of exception that I'll discuss further below applies everywhere and at all times for all other animals. The law from which they are included by way of their exclusion is always already suspended for them, with the exception of some companion animals who are granted feeble legal, legal protections. In Canada, as in other criminal codes, uh, uh, as in other criminal codes, um, animal research, animal agriculture, and so on, among other institutions of violence, are literally exempted from the law in specific legal clauses stating as much. So, in this paper, I focus on laboratories and animals used for research. Then, only because their plight has come to the fore uh, as a result of the pandemic, we have all become heavily invested in keeping up with the latest research into vaccines, the side effects. Uh, their ability to, to deal or not deal with the emerging variants and so on. The animals used in the research occasionally make the headlines, but usually only with respect to a particular study that was done, or in some cases, the quote shortage of monkeys uh, that uh, is causing a problem for further research, an article I came across a few months ago. Also because the handling of and response to the pandemic is so deeply intertwined with politics at the local, national and global level, it is perhaps one of the most immediate illustrations of key aspects of Agamben's particular interpretation of biopolitics, which includes discussions of juridical and institutional power, which of course Foucault tried to lead us uh, away from to an extent. So lab animals are bare life laid bare and, uh, and made bare through deliberate genetic manipulation and biotechnological intervention. They are ontologically altered to be at their, uh, they are ontologically altered uh, to be at their essence with no possibility of escape, ontological or otherwise instruments of research. The reduction to bare life is not merely symbolic then or ideological, it is genetic anatomic. The ontology of bare life, Andrew Benjamin points out, is fluid and its nature indeterminate. As such, bare life is neither human nor animal per se, according to the original definition. It falls outside of any specific ontological categorization. In his words, quote, in the strictest sense, all determinations are withdrawn and what emerges is a state to be determined. Hence, spare life discloses a, sp a space in which what awaits is the actualization of a potentiality. What is described in Agamben's Homo Sacer as, quote, mere capacity to be killed. There is a fundamental neutrality, non-particularity out of which bareness is generated, end quote. And he was quoting within that quote, uh, Agamben. To be bare life then is to be killable, to be killed with impunity, uh, to, to, be, to be disposed to being killed, to have the potentiality for being killed and that alone. While it is neither human nor animal, uh, while bare life is neither human nor animal, and while as Agamemnon and others have noted, refugees and detainees and victims of genocide, genocide occupy this position of indeterminacy in our 
modern world or postmodern, depending on how you want to look at it, there's no question that other animals occupy it more in quality and quantity than members of our species. Now, that's not to diminish the experience of these human groups that I've mentioned. I'm talking more about uh, organized systems of violence uh, that have been constructed and of which animals are the victims in, in vast numbers, in the billions. According to Salzani, this indeterminacy can be liberatory. Bare life, he says, can be life of pure potentiality insofar as it is completely unmarked and finally free from any determination, end quote. But only in the wake of a major shift in metaphysics, a shutting down of the anthropological machine would this even be remotely possible, I would argue. In fact, I would argue that to conceive of freedom as indeterminacy is dangerous, um, given how indeterminacy defines precisely the ontological hell into which animals are flung. The research laboratory is the proverbial uh, breeding ground for beings whose existence is reducible to its barest and most indeterminate form. In a laboratory, a ferret is not a ferret per se, but an organism whose body occupies a restricted but nonetheless indeterminate space, by which I mean, by which I mean a space without world-making qualities, a barren space, a kind of void, for a brief period until it is dispatched and discarded. In the lab, the ferret is born out of no thing and no one and returns to no thing and no one. It is as if in its involuntary neutrality, it never existed at all. As evinced in Nazi death camps, the apotheosis of dialectical trends of modernity, or according to Adorno and Horkheimer of European civilization as such, since classical antiquity, quote, the fundamental biopolitical structure of modernity is the decision on the value or non-value of life as such. And that's a quote uh, from Homo Sacker. The arrival of Nazism and fascism, Agamben writes, quote, transformed the decision on bare life into the supreme political principle, end quote. I would argue that this supreme political principle is the one by which human beings have operated in relation to other animals for centuries. And this is the defining feature of human re animal relationships in modernity. Uh, let's call it late modernity. Uh, to be sure, bare life in its original formation was one element of the human being, as it were, while bios was another. But as Agamben has noted, it eventually becomes separated out in as much as some members of the population are reduced to nothing but bare life with no claim to bios whatever. As sovereign, or as Agamben puts it, he who decides on the value or the non-value of life as such, human beings have determined that non-human animals have no value beyond the instrumental. And it is by working on breaking, cutting open, slicing, poisoning, smashing, beating, isolating, humiliating, degrading, and redesigning their bodies in laboratories in the name of protecting, preserving, and perpetuating, perpetuating human life that we assert this power most clearly. Ironically, although we have cast non-human animals outside the purview of the law, they can be killed, but not sacrificed. Uh, yet, as we know, researchers literally refer to killing animals used in research, whether slowly through torturous experiments or through a deliberate act, once the animal has served its purpose, um, they refer to those animals as sacrifices, even though the practice, practice of killing animals in labs holds none of the elements of a religious sacrifice which despite and probably in part to excuse the horrific brutality being perpetuated against animal victims of sacrifice involve prayer, occasionally petitions for forgiveness, a kind of sanctification, no matter how contradictory of the animal. According to this delusional narrative of sacrifice, not only are the animals being sacrificed, but they are in fact sacrificing themselves for the greater good of humanity, something Teresa mentioned in her discussion with lab uh, technicians. Um, this self-serving mystification of routine barbarism fits perfectly into the meta-narrative of human supre supremacism and exceptionalism. To our greatness, all others must surrender, and upon their surrender, our greatness depends. Interestingly, when Agamben talks about the Nazi death camps, he pays particular attention to the cruel experiments conducted on prisoners and notes that they are, quote, universally taken to be one of the most infamous chapters in the history of the National Socialist regime, end quote. There's absolutely no question that the tortures of, of a factory farm are no less horrifying than those of a laboratory. For the animal is subject to the violence, pain is pain, suffering is suffering, no matter what form the brutality takes. However, there is something particularly heinous about intentionally and with studied precision causing extreme physical pain, often to the point of death, and extreme psychological torment, often to the point of uh, quote unquote madness or uh, in, 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 trauma that, uh, that cannot be recovered from to another living being to see what happens, to see how they respond to extract knowledge. So I'm gonna move on to the next section, which is the lab as permanent space of exception. 
animal researchers and animal research institutions like the National Institutes for Health in the United States are to animals bear life as, quote, the sovereign who, having the legal power to suspend the valid validity of the law, legally places himself outside the law, end quote. And again, that's a gombin. The researchers stand outside the juridical order and are not subject to the law in the sense that the laws against cruelty against animals do not apply in the laboratory. In the laboratory, the law does not apply, but the fact that it does not apply it is itself legally sanctioned. The laboratory is a space of exception par excellence. Like the, like the death camp, the lab is a physically demarcated space, but defined, uh, but defined by its indeterminacy or the indeterminacy of its occupants, as we have discussed, which in the case of animals used for research is a kind of ontological as much as ethical, legal, or political indeterminacy. At the same time, the lab, like the camp, becomes a, quote, zone of irreducible indistinction, end quote, which is again at Gombin, where there is a collision between an a collision between and integration of Zoe and Bios, politics and bare life, right and fact. The entity that, by, uh, that is by nature excluded from the law, the lab animal, so-called, is at the center of it, especially in the time of a pandemic, where an urgent and accelerated search for treatment, vaccines, and cures and the pursuit of extraordinary and unprecedented profits are underway. Without its function as experimental object, knowledge about the virus and its prevention would not be gained and laws and norms designed to regulate the life and death of members of the, non, of the human population would not be established. While animals are literally the lifeblood blood of this frantic project, which of course is heavily invested in capital or tied up with global capital, they are thoroughly and utterly abandoned by it and those responsible for it. And I quote Agamben again, the relation of exception is a relation of ban. He who has been banned is not in fact simply set outside the law and made indifferent to it, but rather abandoned by it, that is exposed and threatened on the threshold in which life and law outside and inside become indistinguishable." End quote. Abandonment goes far beyond these categories for other animals ensnared in the atrocity apparatus. Abandonment is a lived experience for them and causes profound psychological trauma. Abandonment may very well be one of the things that other animals feel, feel most acutely when left to rot in their cages, stalls, and crates, for their nature is to be with, to care for, and to be cared for, to trust, and to love. When they realize that not only will care and love and trust be withheld, or trust be undermined, but will be replaced with its opposite, egregious harm inflicted deliberately and relentlessly, their feeling of abandonment must be overwhelming and unbearable. One sees it in their eyes. Why hast thou forsaken me? The state of exception in the lab is permanent. It, be, quote, becomes a new and stable spatial arrangement inhabited by the bare life that more and more can no longer be inscribed in that order, end quote. As biotechnological interventions in genetic engineering become more widespread and more sophisticated, the possibility of rebellion and resistance against this perverse world order, and I'm referring to the, an the animals themselves as well as um, attempts to, uh, to liberate animals from without, are radically diminished for the ontological are radically diminished for the ontological distinction between the animal and the machinery of violence that persecutes it is blurred. Its objection is inscribed in its genetic code. To sum up, as a zone of exception, the laboratory and its non-human occupants are literally outside the law, while the human agents within it are not subject to the law's restrictions, having themselves decided on what the laws are and to whom, when, and where they apply. For animals, the lab is the camp, while human beings are the Führer, the living law, whose very utterances slice down her middle, restrain her, inject her with this contaminant, with this virus, become the law at the moment of utterance. Agamemnon suggests that with the Nazi eugenics program, biopolitics becomes a thanapolitics, a politics of death. In our time, the liquidation of individual beings metaphysically, ontologically, and physically is in our disease society, the central device for the preservation of life. We too are governed by thanapolitics with our animal kin, the most brutalized of all its victims. So I have a small final section, if I have time, just uh, like a page left. Um, this is uh, moving now to Musa. Again, a little bit of, a, um, of an awkward turn here, but uh, I always like to talk about Marcuse, and I think he has something important to say. So this is the social function of aggression. Although stemming from a very different intellectual tradition uh, uh, than Agamben and speaking in a different register, as it were, Marc Marcuse too argues that modernity or, late, or what he more specifically refers to as advanced industrial society is founded on a series of contradictions. He too notes that the rampant disregard for life is seen as pivotal for the preservation and amelioration of life. Marcuse points out that the investment in technologies of mass destruction is deemed integral to the maintaining of peace and the preservation of life. And that the most immoral act is, act is, seen, act is, seen, as a, is seen as a moral. 
the pursuit of life's preservation and its annihilation is present in both science and the economy. He writes, quote, just as in the contemporary scientific enterprise, so in the economic enterprise and in that of the nation as a whole, constructive and destructive achievements work for life and work for death, procreating and killing are inextricably united, end quote. With respect to our main focus today, the animal researcher works for life to earn a living and to preserve human life and works for death as an agent of death to those whose lives are not worth living, what Nazi eugenicists termed Lebensunwerten Lebens. The society thus constructed is sick, Marcuse tells us, quote, because its basic institution and relations, its structure uh, are such that they do not permit the use of the available material for the optimal development and satisfaction of in individual needs. He's referring to human needs, but I would add animal needs. Individuals are subject to, quote, surplus repression in order to ensure they remain operative in the cycle of production and consumption and fully integrated or in harmony with society without recourse or even the desire to challenge the existing assumptions and practices, which they cannot even recognize as curtailing rather than advancing their freedom in the first place. In response to surplus repression, aggression is released on an individual societal and institutional level so that it can be mobilized to maintain the status quo, which is perpetual war, uh, um, which is defined by perpetual war, among other things. In this climate, people become accustomed to and immune to atrocity. In this in the society that calls itself free, but is it grounded in unfreedom, radical violence is simply a fact of life and new stories and images of it appear alongside new stories and images of pleasing or uplifting events. Um, the in, in Marcuse's words, the consequence is a psychological habituation of war, which is administered to a people protected from the actuality of war, a people who by virtue of this habituation easy familiar, easily familiarizes itself with the kill rate as it is already familiar with other rates, such as those of business or traffic or unemployment. The people are conditioned to live with the hazards, the brutalities and the mounting casualties of the war in Vietnam in his time, just as one learns gradually to live with the everyday hazards and casual casualties of smoking, of smog or traffic. The photos which appear in the daily newspapers and in magazines with mass circulation, often in nice and glossy color, show rows of prisoners laid out or stood up for interrogation, in quotes, little children dragged through the dust behind armored cars, mutilated women, end quote. So finally, today's news articles also show mink in barren iron cages, gripping the bar, staring out helplessly at the viewer as they await extermination to prevent the transmission of a virus humans are responsible for unleashing onto the world through, tor through the torture and murder, murder of animals to begin with. Such flashes of horror appear alongside vegan recipes or articles about the urgency of addressing, addressing climate change and habitat destruction. Uh, and also feel good stories. In this toxic atmosphere, truth no longer holds sway, but is subtly mixed with half or downright untruths. Ultimately, the media is the mouthpiece of repressively desublimated aggressive tendencies and lead us down the road to inertia, where the pain that might seize a healthy, well-adjusted individual at the sight of a terrified caged mink is dull to the point of non-existence. Meanwhile, the critical thought that might emerge from the empathic pain a healthy person would experience is stifled from the beginning. There is a weakening of the sense of guilt and a deflection of responsibility from the individual to the system, which if no one really controls cannot be held accountable. This includes the researcher who is acting on behalf of the greater good. His actions are technologically mediated with devices, instruments, machines, appliances, and so on. And so it is not he who carries out the acts of violence as such, not directly, and therefore he holds uh, no accountability. In a sixth society, my last uh, sentence, defined by a politics of death, no one is held fully accountable, institutionalized barbarism, barbarism against those who are reduced to bare life, life unworthy of being lived, intensifies as new technologies of violence emerge and new catastrophes, including global pandemics, which are themselves a product of a society at odds with life strike. That's it. Thank you, uh, Zipporah, thanks for that. It's great to have these debates placed in the kind of very contemporary context of COVID and our uh, and, and, and your kind of outlining of uh, all these problematic power relationships and how they've been enacted during the past year and a half. It's really, really useful to hear that. So thank you. Um, can I invite uh, Pablo and Michael to put cameras on as well and also invite anybody else who's uh, willing and able to put cameras on as well. So again, that the speakers are not looking at uh, just a list of names. It's good for us to engage as human beings if we if we can. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for that. Um, and I'll open it up for questions, comments, responses. And I suppose I also want to note 
Sipora, Michal, Pablo, you're also allowed to ask questions, respond, give comments to your fellow presenters as well. This isn't all necessarily just directed at you. So if, if any of you have kind of responses or queries or comments, then, then you're welcome to make those too. So uh, does anyone have any questions or comments or responses? I have a question for Pablo. Okay, we'll do that, and then I'll come to Amani, who's just put their uh, just put her hand up. But Michael, you go first, and then I'll come to Amani. So I, I think Sipora and Pablo that uh, you both were really interesting, and I just want to ask Pablo a question. So you said in the in the last presentation, you asked what are the ontological and epistemological condition that made human making distinguish between themselves and non-human animals and other people, and I wonder. First, what do you think about it? And second, if you think it's only social constructure, but or also maybe psychological nature of human, because we see here in history a lot of examples, not only from this time. Yes, um, well, it's, it's the both questions are very <laughs> big questions, but so one thing that I'm very influenced here by Dinesh Wadipwell, and he says in the work against animals that uh, the sovereign, the human sovereign, uh, and he talks of the human sovereign as an individual, as a subject, um, is positioned first epistemologically as a sovereign, and then from Oh, Pablo, we've lost you. That's not just me, is it? As everyone else. Can you okay. hear me now again? Because yeah, yeah, you're back. Go back, yes, a couple of, go back a couple of sentences because we yes, lost it, you it, for about yes. 10 seconds. Well, I was saying that the, well, what Wadiwell argues is that we are positioned as sovereign, epistem as, as epistemic subjects, epistemic sovereigns, as it were, and that it is from that vantage point that we construct ethics. So the idea is that. Mm, all these things that I was saying about, you know, the epistemological conditions, the ontological conditions, the psychopolitical kind of paradigm in which we are uh, constituted as subjects, precede ethics and precedes decisions and precedes those choices. So the question of psychological nature, so that's what I think that is really what they were in a way. But then the issue of psych the psychology of humans, and here I, I draw a lot on Heidegger. So he explains that the logos or language has a gathering ability. So if you think of animals as real unique beings, uh, language in itself turns real entities, real beings into concept of the animal. Just think about when you are looking now at the screen and you see here, I don't know, a pen, right? You see the pen as a pen. So it's not, although this pen is real and it's this unique pen, if you like, there is a kind of conceptuality that is always working there. And what Heidegger says is, it is language in itself that creates dichotomies and purity. So that's kind of, I believe, one of the crucial aspects of why, and it's not only a Western matter, what Heidegger would probably say is, it's a, it's a part of human nature and the part of the nature of language to create that. What we can do, then the reader would come, is to try to deconstruct it and try to always be attentive to how is language here operating or, you know, this ontological aspects or whatever thing. So that's what I can say now very briefly, but it's a bit, these questions are so big, uh, we, we could talk about it for ages. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, Michael's put a thumb up, so I think your answer is approved of. Um, Amani, you have your hand up. Right. Thank you. Um, I have one question for Pablo as well, because um, I'm not sure if I understood it correctly. I've not had anything to do with interconstitutionality up until now. And one of the things I asked myself is um, concerning intersectionality. There is a lot of debate still going on, one of them being um, whether it's persons or individuals or whether it's oppression systems that are located intersectionally um, intersectional I don't know <laughs> um, and with um, your your suggestion of interconstitutionality to me this 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 um, problem or this question arises in you because um, at least in my mind, intersectionality can be used both for individuals and for 
um, systems of oppressions, whereas I think in activism or a lot of people tend to still use it for individuals, whereas um, your interconstitutionality concept to me at least sounds as if it was designed to, to locate um, systems of oppressions and not um, individuals' positions in it. If, if, if that um, phrasing. <laughs> I, I understand, <laughs> I understand problem. your question. And uh, actually I would say like you were saying both in truth, like the, my work in my thesis is trying to understand how language structures our subjectivities to be anthropocentric and sovereign, so the individual part. And here, uh, epistemology and kind of oppression systems, knowledge systems, whatever we want to call it, right? I call it Western conceptuality in my work. Uh, that um, the, all those are interconstituted, as Clay Kim says. So when she's saying racism and animalness are interconstituted all the way down, see, that claim operates at the level of, if you like, oppression systems or knowledge systems. But then she also tells us, this is Kim again, um, these taxonomies of power structure how we see, think, feel, and act. So down to the level of individual subject, as if, if you like. So I think what interconstitutionality, the move that it tends to make, is partly, um, so if I don't have time, but I've read a lot of intersectional work, not so much on intersectionality, so people talking on, about intersectionality, but authors that situate their work in intersectional scholarship. And what one sees is this idea of externality is very present. So one sees that in many occasions, people think of oppression systems or individuals and so on as being in a position of externality, like the image of AFCO in this case was their oppression systems are separated from the subjects. I think that image is present in intersectional scholarship a lot. And I just, what I'm trying to say is both the oppression systems, knowledge systems or whatever, they are interconstituted. And, and I, I'm not saying that, Kledzin Kim has said that. The, what I claim, what my work is to articulate that in a more systematic way, if you like. But I'm just endorsing what they say, basically. And I think it's a, already this interconstitutional method is present in AFCO already. It, I just think it's inconsistent when she says gender is lived through race, for example. And then we see that, uh, that the house that is the kind of knowledge system or the oppression system, if you like, it's still separated. In, in the metaphor out there, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, so yeah, if, maybe I'm being more coist, I don't know how to call it, that Afko herself or something like that. But uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's yeah. Okay, other questions or responses? Um, I have, well, actually, I, I have three. I also had a question, if, but you can okay, go, you go. I have some, but you go, Pablo, go for it. I, I had a question for Michal, actually, because uh, the, the other part of my work on animal language, uh, I draw a lot on the work of Eva Meyer and Donaldson and Kim, because Hartford Platten as well. She has a wonderful, with uh, Donald Sue Donaldson and Ryan Wilcoxon, a uh, sort of vine sanctuary. And then you explore this idea that animals are, are agents that make they, they make decisions, they are self-determining agents and so on. And also in the literature on resistance, so Jason Reibald, Timothy Pachirat, Dines Wadigal, and Zibora herself, I believe, she has uh, done work as well on resistance. So if we think that animals are subjects who make decisions, you kind of put a, a lot of stress in, at some moments in your presentation, trying to say, well, how can we understand their thinking if we if we don't speak the same language? And there was something the idea that I think you said we cannot see the intentions of the animals. Uh, if we so if we can not really understand their intentions, how can we understand the power relationships and so on? But Eva Meyers has this wonderful book that I think it's called When Animals Speak, for example. And she's kind of trying to say, we create common languages, you know, between humans and animals. We can understand each other quite clearly. Like when a dog is scratching a door, it's saying, I want to go out, I don't know. All sorts of things, right? And here we see this in when they resist, it's very obvious in these kind of cases as well. So I was just having doubts about this stress that animals are not intentional beings. I mean, it depends what you mean by intention, obviously. That's very important, the definition here of intention. But even whatever the definition, I would try to then say, well, why don't we define the intention from the having a, I don't know, but um, yes, that's what, I had doubts about that, you know? Yeah. Yes, so I didn't say they are not intentional beings, they do. They are intentional and they do have agency, of course. What I'm saying is that we should be very care really careful when we, 
on how we understand their intention and the thoughts, because eventually we have a different biology and, and we think differently. So I think the, the main focus when we study power relation, and of course the agency, we can see it, we can see it through the ground. And that's what I'm saying is, I think that one can learn about their intention through their behaviors, not through mind reading. I don't think we can't learn, we can't learn intentions, we can. But unlike humans, I think the focus should be more on the study intention through their behaviors on the ground, on what we see. First, we need to study the, the influence of non-human animals. And we should be really careful when we study their intentions, because sometimes we enforce our life experience on their experience, which is different. That is, it's not that we should not learn intentions, we should focus on the influence, not because we can't focus on the intentions, but because eventually we want to understand the dynamic and the way non-human animals affect each other and humans. If we stick to intentions, we stay with our human ideas of what we think about non-human animal intentions, which is not necessarily what is really going on in their mind. So it's more a materialist point of view rather than interpretation point of view. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And Chiara, I know you've got your hand up, but I wonder if, Zipporah, do you want to respond to that question as well? Because as, as Pablo said, you've done work in that area and you're you're doing work at the moment on animal agency, I understand. So is, is that something you kind of want to, I don't want to drag you into a question that you weren't asked, but it seemed like there's a logical connection if, if, the, if there's a, a reasonable response that you want to give. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I haven't actually done any formal work on animal resistance. It's more that in my earlier, my earlier work, uh, I challenged concepts of resistance within spaces and sites of exploitation. I felt that they were glorified particularly by Donna Haraway and other post-human thinkers and that they continue to be glorified. Uh, I myself mentioned in this paper, you know, that there, there's a possibility of, of micro acts, if you will, of resistance of the animals within these confines, but as such, um, I think that we have to be really careful when we talk about resistance and agency, yet here I am, as, as uh, you've mentioned, Brett, um, entering into a project now focusing on agency, um, not so much resistance, although that will be an element of it, but more agency actually as it, as it expresses itself through friendship. Um, I haven't really started <laughs> the formal research on this, so it's sort of more based on personal experiences at animal sanctuaries, including Vine, uh, but I only spent a short period there, but here in Spain um, uh, at Gaia, Fundacion uh, Gaia um, in, in uh, Catalan, Catalonia and uh, other sanctuaries that I've also volunteered at and, and just really everyday kind of anecdotal experience. Um, what fascinates me is that friendship is an interspecies in relationality is, is so fundamental uh, in especially in environments where it's permitted uh, where the conditions are such that animals can actively cultivate friendships uh, between and among species. Um, so I'm fascinated in, uh, in embodied expressions really of agency in, in uh, micro choices that animals might make uh, in terms of where they decide to sleep that day, who they decide to sleep beside, who they want to play with um, that often cross uh, species barriers. And also potentially, uh, I haven't really looked into this yet. It's just really a research question. So I don't really have anything uh, substantive to say, but I'm also interested in how animals might resist the confines of sanctuaries themselves. Because although these are the best places for animals on earth at the moment, uh, at least for domesticated animals um, uh, that would otherwise be doomed to factory farms, laboratories, or what have you, um, they're, they're areas which uh, Patrice uh, Jones talks about herself. Uh, they're, they're also human created structures uh, that, have, uh, that are delineated territorially. So in, in Vine's case, she uh, does her best to open up the possibility of cows choosing to rewild. So that would be an act of agency. And I, I think that's maybe the purest uh, uh, example of, of a kind of agency in a sanctuary where cows decide, the ones that are healthy enough are given the opportunity to choose if they basically go and graze in the hinterlands, which is still, there's still a barrier, but it's the wildest that it can possibly be within zoning laws, which unfortunately limit, uh, limit the wildness. But so yeah, so that I'm just kind of really beginning an exploration in that area, but I'm particularly interested in phenomenological expressions of agency 
I'm not so sure the extent to which agency, I, I'm, I'm sort of on the fence about agency and politics. I was very much influenced by Willa and Sue, uh, obviously um, uh, learning, studying with and, and learning from them, um, but I'm not necessarily convinced actually. Uh, Angie Pepper has swayed me more in the direction of wondering if it's even necessary or useful for animals to think of uh, sort of human political paradigms in the context of animal uh, communities. And do, do, does it matter in a sense, do, do we need to conceive of a politics for animals or do we more need to conceive of other ways of addressing animal freedom and, and creating conditions for animal freedom? So I'm really on the fence about that aspect of agency. Okay, so thank, thank you, okay. thanks a lot. Um, Chiara, you had, a, you had your hand up. Yeah, but it is a side question for Zipporah. It's just a curiosity. But is what do you think about the um, the rhetoric rhetoric I would say of of the human beings reduced to biological function during the quarantine? Because Agamben has expressed mm -hmm. themselves uh, harshly on this uh, on this uh, topic. So, but it's just a, if you have an idea. Not what this, I haven't read. This is the thing when you're uh, a kind of part time academic, you really miss out on most of the current research. So uh, what can you tell me what he says specifically about that? And then I can respond at least because I haven't read it. I have no idea what he said. Yeah, it was it was basically talking about the, um, the state of exception caused by the quarantine and the imposition. And uh, it actually, yeah, he composed a poem also. And it says, that um, the, there is this day sub they they um as um they have um they deprived us with our freedom and our love and so we 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 just um, we are just lay with our bare life i would say with our bio right. life. but so yeah your topic uh, give us space to see things differently so and um, yeah yeah I thank you oh, sorry go ahead <laughs> no no it was just this uh double binary um uh, this is state of exception also for human beings and then we have the animals so well, I yeah. would find that less convincing in a way because uh, not in a way, but uh, actually, um, I don't. I think. I mean, I have my own position on on uh, top down authoritarian rules uh, and states of emergency and exception being imposed on pu the public without consultation. Um, I don't know that. It depends probably on what part of the world we're talking about, but I, I wouldn't suggest that the experience, however horrible, isolating, uh, and you could say dehumanizing and de-animalizing it, it, it has been for many people um, and really life altering in negative ways. I don't know that it means that we've been reduced to bare life as such. Um, I mean, it's a Gobman's concept. So what am I, to, who am I to say? But I think his concept rings much more true when we're referring to Muslim, uh, the people uh, in Auschwitz, the victims of uh, the Nazi genocide, refugees, people in, um, displaced persons camps, uh, migrants, um, and so on. Um, I think in the way that at least I understand the concept as he presents it, especially in homo soccer, that resonates much more. Um, again, I just sort of crudely, this is I think what happens when you're a part-time academic, you just kind of grab things that are interesting to you. And, and then I just ran with it. Uh, I ran with this idea because I, I found myself just, it kept coming to mind because of the state of emergency that the whole world was placed under uh, and, and how this was justifying and, and how animal experimentation was kind of re-emerging in the news, just as fur re-emerged as a fashion uh, accessory uh, about a decade ago after there was a huge protest movement against it. That said, there's this, these kind of waves where certain things that were considered abominable, or at least was one area where people were mm, more open to, to, being, uh, to expressing doubts about whether or not they supported. Um, now it's sort of, re-established as, as a norm. And so the state of exception itself that we've, we're still under, I would argue, has normalized um, exceptional, but normalized treatment, uh, exceptional, but normalized over the centuries, uh, barbaric treatment of other animals. So I'm interested in that kind of loop that, and that I think that Agamben provides a, an interesting framework, but like I've said, 
um, and tried to make very clear. I'm not convinced uh, by his project overall, and I'm uh, struggle with the way in which concepts of biopolitics have been used within animal studies, particularly with posthumanism. I do think there's a depoliticizing tendency, and I still hold by that, even though I actually use the word biopolitics uh, uh, <laughs> to advance my own argument in this particular case. Thank you. So Thank you. If, if you can point me to that article, I'd love to read yeah. it, and I should have looked, looked it up. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're, we're at time, but there's a question I really want to ask, but I don't want to keep everyone over time if we don't. So I'll check with the speakers. Is it okay if I ask a question, even though we're a few minutes over? We have got an hour's lunch break. Obviously, anyone else, if you need to kind of leave, then please, please do. Uh, well, actually, I've got two questions. One, I really want to know where Daniel's walking, because he's been walking for the past, and, and I've been trying to work out what country is in the background for the past 20 minutes. <laughs> I, I'm in uh, in Gothenburg, Sweden. Okay, all right. So um, I'm on my way to a midsummer. Uh, uh, oh, activity. okay. <laughs> it's a long way. I've been watching you thinking, get a bike. But anyway. Uh, um, I'm actually <laughs> having a bike, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yep. <laughs> Enjoy you. midsummer. Anyway, sorry. My proper question is, I'm wondering if, and I don't know if this is a, a fair question, this is a speculative question of where you think human-animal relationships in terms of power are going or where they might go in the future. And I was thinking about the ideas of kind of the ways in which when, when power relationships change, it can be that power is given, that, you know, a powerful group or community or individual gives power to somebody else. Power is taken, uh, by, usually by, you know, revolutionary means or something, or, or those in power kind of relinquish some power, just give up some power. Uh, or there might be other routes that it can kind of go, but obviously there's a history of sort of, of power being shifted around in various ways. I'm wondering if, and I say this is entirely speculative, where you think human-animal power relationships might go in the future. And of course, the answer might be they're going to stay exactly the same. I'm not necessarily asking you to extrapolate some amazing science fiction possibility. I'm wondering where you think this might go. Uh, Michal, can I come to you? For, I'll come to you in the order that you spoke, if that's all right. It's a really hard and good question. Uh, as I said, it goes to, to some different direction. There is the direction of uh, Kimlika and Dolanson, uh, in which they talk about uh, how, how can we include non-human animals as citizens. Uh, I think it's one direction. I don't necessarily completely know my view about this. I'm not sure it will be good for the non-human animals this direction because I think that we think about non-human animal citizens from our human view. So this is one direction. Another direction is to, to see the interaction between human and non-human non animals. Uh, in cities, for example, uh, now in Israel, there is a city, Haifa, in which uh, pigs are all over the city. So there are researchers who study the dynamic between human and non-human animals in the cities and how can we, how in the political context, we can do something to, to make these relations better. And yeah, and I, I think uh, these two different directions, one is more a politically theoretical direction, one, one is more a toward policy, toward policy. And um, I think that the, the second direction is most, more focused on how it's not included non-human animals as, as, a, as agency, but it's, it's more talked about animals. We as human, we talked about the situation. And uh, I, think, I think it uh, might be a good direction because as humans, we can do something for animals to make their situation better. And now we don't really talk about them so much in the political context. But I think if we will raise our voices to animals in this field, so there will be more a rise of voices toward them also in the politics itself. The, there will be more political parties, for example. There will be changes in the law for animals. Okay, thank, thank you. That's really useful. Pablo. Yeah. Uh, so I actually have thought about this question in a speculative sense, because in the last section of my thesis, I write a kind of what would happen in a post-climate change era, what could happen, just imagine a future, that, you know, in a speculative sense. But the first thing I want to say is that to me, power is given, taken and relinqu relinquished. But as I think in part, um, uh, Michal was explaining, for, to me, I think of power a lot, like Foucault. 
So its power will always be there no matter what happens. And, you know, but I'm sure you know that. So that's just that note. But then I think it depends a lot on our response to cl climate change now and in the uh, near future, right? And it's completely unknowable, I believe. We cannot know at all what will happen. So we might just, humans might go extinct. That's a possibility, very realistic in my view. And if that happens, then that's it. That's the end of the story, I suppose, from our side at least. And what, what would happen to other species, I suppose, many animals would go extinct as well, many species and many animals would die. So the first option is just death and extinction. The second option is death as well, which is already happening now. So death is going to be in the picture for sure. Um, but at some point, when that point comes, no one knows, we decide to make a massive change. And what would that change look like? So we can have a dictatorial, dictatorial systems, for example, that could happen kind of 1984 kind of option that's possible. And we take more powers and we are more oppressive to sort of, you know, kind of dystopian world that can happen. We might remain just more or less as we are, but trying to fix things in a capitalist kind of society. Can a capitalism be kind of transformed to have some sort of sustainable way of living that is capitalist? Very difficult question to answer that. I have no clue how to answer that. And there is also a more, not utopian because I think it's realistic, but perhaps a more zoo democratic system could emerge in which we say, as you were saying, we just, relinquish powers, we do kind of a truce in, in a Swadipal sense, uh, kind of follow the democratic practices to really change in a more, I don't know, beautiful way, perhaps. Um, and then what could that zero democracy look like exactly? Um, it's very difficult to know, but I think that here would be a more a matter of relinquishing power. I'm not sure that animals can take power. Um, that I mean, it, it might be possible in some context and in some cases. It, I'm not saying I don't want to discard that as saying this is not a possibility at all in an, some, some scenarios. But I do think that if we are to build a democratic system, if that option we take that option at some point, we need to relinquish power. Like I think that needs to happen. Um, but all this, as you said, is a speculative. Like I have no clue what what of these scenarios will happen or other ones. Of course, I'm not. I don't want to reduce all the options to these ones. There are more, I'm sure. But yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pablo Zipora. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, I'm fairly pessimistic and I, I'd opt for the dystopian <laughs> uh, death and annihilation or the survival uh, or the continuation of the current system. Um, I see it only intensifying. I, I'm, let me qualify this. This is what's happening now, and this is one avenue we could go. So the intensification of current practices of of violence, which, uh, as we've discussed, um, you know, have entered into the, the realm of, of genetics and ontological and biotechnological manipulation, uh, which takes us into a whole new new territory with respect, uh, at least to medical research, um, not to mention all the other forms of violence. I think what's needed, and I look to John Sambamatsu for this really uh, is a, a total transformation in the concept of our species. Uh, I mean, that goes without saying for all of us here, but the more I read, including Agamben and including and returning to Heidegger and other thinkers, it's, I just wanna throw books <laughs> at the wall. Like, can we just get over it? Um, this constant comparison and this constant comparison at our advantage and at the disadvantage of other animals. And I see it in my daily, uh, life with with non animal liberationists uh, and and in the literature and the canon itself, um, and critical animal studies is a really important intervention. Um, but we need a much wider, broader, deeper, radical transformation in how we understand ourselves as a species because species because it go power relations and particularly relations of domination and violence go way beyond. Uh, um, the uh, political economy. Uh, it's it's a, something that is universal to, to the species uh, in a sense, it's obviously culturally grounded, um, but it happens to be uh, universal. And the differences with women, for example, women were able to um, transform systems of relations for themselves and we're still working on that, um, but quite uh, more or less effectively, depending again on when and where, um, because they're able to recognize the power imbalance for what it was and take action that uh, humans recognize as being meaningful. So within the political sphere. So that I'm not really saying anything new here, but the challenge is um, how do we really politicize these, these uh, critiques that we've uh, long since established around uh, human supremacism and so on. But 
until, and the problem is, I think there's the other direction here is this green capitalism and human, uh, humane uh, farming and so on and, and happy meat. And um, this is a direction that we seem to be going. So we have the kind of brutality that's being recognized as brutality, like the extreme expression of total uh, power over other animals in, in factory farms. And we've all become accustomed to those images perhaps too much. And then we have the happy solution uh, being presented by locavores and others who are actually just reestablishing human supremacy. So we have to be more imaginative um, because uh, staying within the capitalist framework uh, is not going to solve the problem. That's very clear because capitalism just intensifies and worsens these power relations. Uh, and returning to a sort of pastoralism where animals have a, a relative freedom and there's this, there's this kind of, uh, there's this mythology of uh, symbiosis and a kind of uh, uh, a voluntary, again, almost sacrificial relationship between the animal and the human being that locavores and others, particularly feminist locavores, uh, have mistakenly pointed to as being sort of a self, uh, um, uh, um, almost a soteriological um, position, uh, that is completely misguided as well. So I don't know where power's going to go. I, the final thing I'm, I'll say is I, I'm not sure that um, politicizing animal life as such in, in, in the vein of Donaldson and Kimlicka, or even in a more radical way outside of a liberal uh, framework that they propose, I don't know that that's really the solution. I wonder if it's not actually a return or a rediscovery of a kind of a much more um, organic, if you will, interrelationality that actually does away with uh, conceptions and concerns with power. So a being with, I'm using the phenomena, phenomenological language here, but uh, I don't know how we would do that. Uh, the only place that that's possible at all are is sanctuaries and those are isolated kind of oases in this Infern global infernal that we've we've created. So I really don't have the answer. Those are just some ramblings on the topic. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, and a, and, a, and a great way to end. And we have overrun quite a bit. So thank you to uh, everyone for staying around, and certainly thank you to the uh, three speakers for giving more time than you agreed to when you when you uh, proposed a paper uh, for the conference. So um, thank you, Michael, Pablo, and uh, Sipora. Um, uh, we can all now leave back to kind of the main room. There's 45 minutes for lunch. You should have had an hour, but you've only got 45 minutes now um, as I enact my power as chair to make this uh, session last longer than it should have done. Um, so yeah, have a good lunch break. And we'll, uh, thanks a lot again to the three of you and everyone who is here in this panel. Thank you. And thanks, Brad, for sharing it as well. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Thanks. And thanks to the other two speakers. I'd love to be in touch and look at your work closely if you can. Oh, that would be lovely. Uh, I don't know, send me an email. Yeah. Yeah. That would be fantastic, really... uh, Zipra. Okay. I would love the same thing. We could have a chat one day. And also, you know, yeah. I'm from a town that is between Barcelona and Valencia. Ah, eres so, español. No sabía si. Sí, sí. I didn't know if you were from Spain or from. Uh, where, where do you live? If you don't mind country. me asking. Can, can, can I just can I interrupt really quickly just to say? Oh yeah, do we yeah, yeah, just, yeah, sure. Say, no, no, you can stay in here chatting if you want. That's completely fine. Daniel's back. Um, so, <laughs> Go walking. What, what, what have you been doing for the five minutes we couldn't see you, Daniel? That's what I want to know. Um, <laughs> oh, he's disappeared again. He went for a swim. Went swimming. No, you're perfectly fine to stay in here, but obviously after a time, you might have people for the next panel coming in. I'm just saying, I've got to go out because there's admin stuff I need to do. Thank you, Brett. But if you want to carry on chatting, please do stay in here. Thank you. Thank you. So, Zebra, where are you based, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, don't stop the recording. It's still, it's still, um,